going on? No. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Makes it a little easier on me. We just got through rehearsing and uh, our soprano soloist Priscilla Baskerville um, had a job this morning in New York, so she just got up here a few minutes ago. So we had, it's kind of last minute, but I've done a number of these with her before, so she's, and she's a total pro, so I'll just write down. So Duke Ellington's Sacred Music, this is some interesting and obscure stuff. Not many people know this work. It's Leighton Ellington's life. In uh, 1965, he was commissioned to do a concert of sacred music yeah, for uh, in a church, a large church in New York. And um, this was the first time he had ever really done anything on those proportions of, of sacred or spiritual music. He had written a number of things before that. Uh, certainly, I would say, all, for me, all of his music is very spiritual because he was just such a spiritual person. And, uh, and that really comes through in his music, no matter what he's, whether he's talking about a train or he's talking about sex or whatever he's talking about, <laughs> it's very spiritual. But sometimes he's really addressing his feelings towards God. And um, his most famous, the most famous of these pieces is Come Sunday, which is in uh, many of the Protestant hymnals. And, um, it's just, it's, I think it's the best uh, piece of, uh, uh, oh, it's a, Best sacred song uh, uh, that America has produced. It's 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 very moving. And Priscilla is going to sing that for us tonight. But that that was done in 1943. It was part of a of a long uh, piece that he wrote that he premiered at Carnegie Hall in 1943. And it was an instrumental. And later on, in 1958, he recorded it with Mahalia Jackson, the great gospel singer. And then it became a, a real staple in the jazz. Uh, catalog, but it doesn't really fit into, like all this music that we're going to do today, it doesn't really fit into the normal jazz concert in that this music is about love of God instead of love of women, which most jazz, <laughs> <laughs> most jazz and popular songs are about, you know, love between men and women, so. Um, actually, when I first started working on this stuff in uh, uh, 1993, which is, what, 10 years ago, uh, I was doing a concert of it with uh, Wynton Marcellus, and uh, I had a moment, I played some of the music, and he's, I said, well, you know, I played this one piece, and it was called Heaven. And he says, gee, I don't know if that, th that sounds so much like heaven as uh, uh, women, you know. He said, it's because it's very sensual, and, and yet, well, when we do it, I think you, you'll, you'll see that it really is about heaven, and, and the way Priscilla sings it, it's, it really, um, it's very ethereal feeling. Um, anyway, Ellington did three sacred concerts. He did one in 65, one in 68, and a third one in 1973. And each one was repeated many, many times. Uh, and each of them has very distinctly different music. The first one was kind of a, um, a hodgepodge of things he had written before, like Come Sunday, and some, of the, some pieces that he had done in a show in Chicago in 1962 called My People. And um, somebody asked Duke Ellington, well, who are your people? And he said, the people are my people. Uh, yeah, this, this, this music is totally non-denominational. I, I was trying to, a few years ago, I was, I was working with some producers. They wanted to do a world tour of this music. And um, we were going to get some stars, very big stars, to do it and do a PBS special and everything. And we got a fair amount of funding. We, I forget how much money they needed, but we, we raised most of it, but we couldn't get the rest because some of these corporations said, well, we can't be affiliated with anything that has to do with God, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, because there, there's not, there, outside of the word God, which appears quite a few times in the show, there's nothing that really links it to any one specific religion. Any of the world's, world's religions would, would certainly apply, and any, in fact, anybody that believes in God, I don't think will have any disagreements with anything that we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, of course, those people that don't believe in God, well, they probably wouldn't be interested in this. Uh, although, the music is so beautiful, it's kind of hard to resist. Um, the, uh, well, first of all, any, are there any questions about... Uh, do you have any, is there a question? Over here. Yeah. I'm Sorry. an atheist. I'm very interested. Well, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I remember being a kid, you know, we studied like the religion, all the other religions in the world, just to see what everybody else was thinking about. I thought that was kind of interesting. So, uh, but cer certainly the music is, um, it just speaks for itself. And it's, even if you, no matter what you believe in, I, I think it's going to strike a, a real deep core within you. 
um, my connection with this. I, um, in the 60s, I guess I became aware, late 60s, I might have heard, I saw one of the concerts, I think it was the first one, yeah, 1965, I saw that one on television. And, well, this isn't really my thing. I was young. And uh, then later on, um, in the early 70s, Ellington was, it was, I guess it was 73, Ellington was doing the third sacred concert and he was rehearsing uh, and performing it. He did a performance not far from where I live in, in the Bronx, in New York, uh, uptown. And uh, some of my buddies were in the band, guys that had played in my band had moved on and joined Duke's band by that point. And they said, well, come on up and, uh, and we'll get you in. So I, I went there and I got, I went and I sat and watched them rehearse all this new, this new music. And that was pretty enlightening. I began to get an idea, well, this stuff is kind of, I kind of like it. It's pretty good. You know, this, I liked the show. It was real interesting. It still didn't really get to me until right after Duke died, uh, Duke's son Mercer took over the band. And I, and I, and some of the people quit, a few of the people quit. And, uh, and so one of those people was a trumpet player. And so I got, well, I was very lucky and got called to, to replace him and join the band. So we, I remember one day we went out to Queens to do a sacred concert and we put the whole thing together and we started to play this music and all of a sudden it was like, it just bowled me over. It was so powerful and it just, it was like, we, we got the piece that we're going to play last tonight, uh, Praise God and Dance. It's God calling. Yeah. We got a correction. Okay, we started to play Praise God and Dance and it, it Became like it was like a steamroller. It just was like it's all this forward motion, and it just like it just carried you along like on a wave. And it's a great feeling, and, and a lot of other pieces in there too. I mean, each one has t touches on a different kind uh, or a different genre of this kind of music. And so it's jazz, and yet it, it, it has a lot of, to do with uh, the liturgical tradition of of European music as well. There's there's although Duke was really not. Uh, very well educated. Well, let's just say he wasn't even educated in European music. He was not that particularly interested in it. I mean, here are things. Uh, and all he had to do was maybe you could turn that off. I'm trying to. I thought I did. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Duke really would, had, had no real interest in, in classical music. It's kind of interesting. Billy Strayhorn, who was his uh, arranger, and uh, they worked together. Um, uh, Strayhorn wrote I think, about 600 arrangements for Duke. And Duke wrote, uh, I think, about another 1,500. So yeah, Duke Ellington wrote more music than anybody except for maybe J.S. Bach. Mm -hmm. uh, the pianist uh, uh, Marcus Roberts said, uh, said that even writing that much bad music would be quite an accomplishment. <laughs> I agree with that. I mean, it's, actually, somebody wrote that badly probably wouldn't, you, you would think they wouldn't, uh, they'd run out of steam after a while and kind of give up. Although, you know, you know that film director, uh, the guy who did Plan 9 from Outer Space, Ed Wood? Yeah. Yeah, they made a movie about him, right? Yeah. Ed Wood, yeah. So he made these horrible, like the worst movies ever made, but he kept doing it. He had like, <laughs> You know, he just never gave up. Oh, this one's going to be great, and it'll be even worse than the last one. You know? But yeah, Duke was like, Duke was, well, Duke was this, this genius. Uh, one of his, I used to, well, I'm very friendly with his his sister. Actually, she's quite senile now, but and quite sick. But um, but for many years, I was I was like, she used to always say, "I'm your New York mother," and she would always invite me over to her house, and she always, you know, no matter what time of day or night it was, it was she would always serve champagne. And um, she lived on Park Avenue, and she, and she was just like this really great lady. And um, you know, she would always talk about Duke. Oh, when Duke was, when, well, she would never say Duke. When Edward was was a child, our mother took him to her church and also to his father's church every Sunday. And as an adult, I don't think he ever stepped into a church in his life. But she said he did read the Bible from cover to cover three times. So he was a very very firm believer in God, but never talked about it. Um, but, oh yeah, so I'd go to these parties, Ruth always would have two parties every year. There'd be a party on her birthday, which was July 2nd, and New Year's Eve. 
And so I was on the permanent list and I was always invited. And it'd be very interesting people, all kinds of politicians and artists, um, um, some very famous people and some people like, and I don't know who these people are, you know, just like regular people. Like she had all her relatives, all kinds of, it was, it was a really interesting mix of people. It was wild, you know. And so there was this woman, woman who was like a cousin of Ruth's. And she would, every time I'd see her, she would always, she would always say, he never took a vacation. <laughs> Not one day in his whole life. He never went on vacation. Because for Duke, just his connection with music was an all-consuming thing. There was never... I mean, I love music probably as much as anybody I've ever met, except for him. Uh, maybe not. Wynton Marcellus, he's another one. He never took a vacation either. Uh, I work with Wynton a lot. And, uh, and uh, his idea of a vacation is doing what he does every day. Well, maybe not going to all the meetings and raising money, but certainly all the music and all and, and being with all the people. He really, he's very much like Duke. Duke was a, a real extrovert. He just loved people. And, he, although he was not a church person, he practiced uh, what we all aspire to be. And that is to, um, he didn't treat his neighbor as himself, he treated his neighbors better than himself. In fact, he treated complete strangers better than himself. Uh, and he would go into, like, there's a story, he would go into like a, uh, a luncheonette, just walk into a, now here's the famous, you know, at the height of his you know, fame and everything, Walk into this luncheonette, and instead of waiting for a table, he would just he would walk up to the to the counter, and uh, the woman behind the counter was serving her. And she comes over to him, and he would. Now, any celebrity is looking for. Oh, you're the great son. She comes over and he says, "Oh my, you make that dress look so lovely." And then you go on to tell her about you know, oh the apple. How is the apple? Oh, this apple pie is fantastic. And he would just be like all over her in, and making her feel good. It's like. He couldn't. He would always ask people, "How are your kids? How are they?" And I, I've noticed this in, in other great people. Quincy Jones is like that. With Marcellus, it's like that. They always start every conversation like they always ask you, "How you are? How are your kids?" And and it's always about you. It's never about them. And Duke was like that. Um, he just um, well, you could say maybe for practical reasons. He he said um, that uh, the guys in his band, you know, in order. People would always say, well, you know, your band, all those guys stayed like 30, 40, 50 years. How, how could you do that? Why would they stay with you? Well, how, somebody asked Harry Garney, why did you stay so long? And Harry said, well, every day, Duke brings in new music, and we play it, and it's always interesting, and the band is great. Uh, why would I do anything else? <laughs> and, uh, but for Duke, you know, he said, well, you know, to keep, somebody asked him, well, how do you keep all these guys? He said, well, I have this gimmick. I pay them money. <laughs> But in actuality, he kept the salaries really low. I mean, a few people like Johnny Hodges and Harry Carney, they made, towards the end, they made, made a lot of money. But I saw the payroll in 1938, and he wasn't, you know, the highest paid man was uh, Lawrence Brown at $100 a week. Oh, yeah, Benny Goodman was paying $200 a week in 1938. And, and Benny was not known for his generosity. Benny is... The Jack Benny of jazz. <laughs> Benny, I'll tell you just an aside. Benny, late in his life, Benny called me up one day out of the out of the blue. I get this phone call. This is Benny Goodman. I, I'll tell you two Benny Goodman stories. <laughs> well, actually, I got to tell you three because they're all great. So the first one is I I had this, I started my band like in the early 70s, 1971, and maybe uh, by 1972 we're rehearsing. And the door opens up, and this elderly gentleman, this tall fellow, you know, he sits down in the back of the room, and um, and is listening to us. And a couple of the older guys, our piano player was Dick Katz, and, our, uh, and Lee Conus was playing alto saxophone, so they were much older than me. And um, they start to laugh, and I said, "What's so funny?" And they go, and I said, and I said, "It's Benny." And I said, "Benny who?" And I said, it's Benny Goodman. I said. Wow, I never knew he was so tall. He was like 6'2". He was this big guy. I found out later on he was a really good tennis player. Too. So he sat through the whole rehearsal, you know, like 45, we had 45 minutes left, and he sat through just about to the end, and about after 45 minutes he got up and he said, thank you very much, I really enjoyed it, and then he left. Well, uh, a couple of months later, I, I met Jimmy Maxwell, who, was, who had played trumpet for four years with Benny in, in his heyday from 1939 to 1943. And um, I, said, I told Jimmy the story, and Jimmy says, oh, 
God's completely out of character. He really hated modern music. I can't understand why he did that. He certainly wasn't a nice person. Yeah. Benny was completely self-centered. He was like the opposite of Duke. Um, Could I ask you yeah. about Duke? Duke, yeah. Um, many people say he's uh, America's greatest composer. Mm -hmm. Can you flesh that out and talk about the range of his music and why that may be true? Yeah, well, first of all, he wrote more music than any other American composer. So just in terms of, of volume, he's got everyone beat hands down. It's not even close. Um, but more than that, the, breath, the depth of his music and the breadth of his music. It's like most people who are composers or arrangers, they pretty much do the same thing every time out. It's like, do you ever see like Alfred Hitchcock movies? There's a whole bunch of them that are really kind of the same movie, although I think Hitchcock is a genius and my, my favorite film director. But there's a bunch of his movies that are the spy has to, and, uh, who kills somebody, and then uh, you know, uh, there's somebody who's like, uh, um, wrongly accused and he has to catch the spy and then there's a formula which nobody cares what the formula is and, you know, and so that's he does a lot of movies but Duke every piece is different the guy wrote 1500 pieces and they're completely different how did he how does somebody have that kind of imagination and he in each piece what he did was and this is what really makes music great it makes all art great it's that the the technique um, Technique causes the form of the piece. You, know, you start and you have like some kind of a, a technical idea that you're going to explore, and as you do that, the form kind of arises out of that. And also, the form of the piece kind of dictates the technique that they develop hand in hand. And all great music does that. All great art does that. You know, any great painting certainly does that. And uh, that's so true of Ellington's music. He, he finds each piece will find a, a new technique. He may use that technique once or twice after that, and that's it. But if he does it again in another piece, he's going to develop it in a completely different way. He may start off with that same technique and do, and instead of going over here, we'll go over here. So um, you know, he discovers new colors, new ways to um, uh, combine instruments. You know, he might have two trumpets and a trombone, and tell them to take a, a toilet plunger and put it over the the bell of their instrument, and you remove the the, uh, the stick part. I was like, used to like going into a hardware store, and I'll say, okay, I'll take uh, I, I like one of those uh, plungers with a five inch diameter, and you can keep the stick. And then I goes, Ooh. I said, no, you should try it. It's really great. <laughs> but that was one of his thing, you know, the color. You know, he liked these these really unique colors. In fact, uh, uh, who was it? Somebody said this. It's been attributed to a few different people, uh, but I think it was um, oh, what's his name, the conductor Andre Previn. I believe it. He was the one who really said this. Um, he said, you know, it's like you go to a concert at the Hollywood Bowl, and you see like all your composer and arranger friends in the audience, and it could be like a hundred-piece orchestra. And as soon as they start to play, everybody goes, oh yeah, that's this, and that's this. I know how to do that, I don't know how to write that. And they can, they're figuring out how this stuff is written now. They, can, they understand immediately what they're hearing. And he says, Duke Ellington gets out on the stage, three guys pick up their instruments and start to play, and you go, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> he, he, uh, and you know why, why that is, is, is unique combinations of instruments and, and uh, and also that his music transcends the idiom that it's in. It's like everyone in jazz uses the same kind of techniques when we write music. But when Duke does it, he's telling the story. So it's like he's using that technique, but you don't even realize that he's using it. And we could get to like the most consonant chord that happens all the time. It's the same chord that sounds that Glenn Miller used, exactly the same way, except that he got to it in, a, in such a, a way that when you get there, you don't even know it's the same thing. It's, it, from something that was should be really banal, it, it becomes something so beautiful and, and incredible. Um, and part of that is that everybody plays a good melody. This is an interesting thing. Um, in a in a big band like what Duke had and what we have tonight, there are four trumpets, and three trombones, and five saxophones, you know, and piano, bass, and drums. But of all the horn players, the trombones and the tr trumpets and the saxophones. We're all playing, everybody's playing at the same time, a fair amount of the time, and we have these chords that have lots of notes in them. And we, you know, but everyone has a melody at the same time. Each one of those instruments is playing a melody, but it's in harmony, you know? 
And so most times when we play music like that, it's like, it sounds pretty good out front, and the chords kind of make sense, but the individual people don't have very good melodies. The guy on top does, he's playing the melody that we, you know, he's doing that, but the guy underneath it might be going, he might have something that makes no sense. And all the other people, they don't have anything that makes any sense either. But in Ellington's music, Everybody has such a good melody, it's as good as the top one, or maybe even better. When I, went, when I was in the Ellington band, I remember we played Warm Valley, which was just exquisite. And, uh, um, I played uh, third or fourth trumpet on it. And, uh, my part was so good, at one point the guy who was playing first trumpet said, well, why don't you play first on this? I said, I'm not switching for anything. I love my part. <laughs> in fact, when Ellington or Strayhorn wrote a piece, they would, you know, they would rehearse it, and then the, you know, afterwards they would take a break, and they would go up to the guys in the band. Did you like your part? They would say. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very important. So Duke joked when he said, I had a gimmick, I paid pay them money. And he had a gimmick. He gave them something that they wanted that was really important to them that wasn't money. He tried to win it. And there's a funny story about Britt Woodman, who was, in, who was in the band from 1950 to 1960. I worked with Britt a lot after that, and uh, so he told me the story. He said, I was in the band 10 years, and I asked Duke for a raise. And uh, he kept avoiding me, and this went on for a few weeks. He said, I've been in the band 10 years. I haven't gotten a raise. Duke, I need to have a raise. He said, oh, Duke would say, oh, meet me in my, uh, in my dressing room after the show, and then Duke wouldn't be there. You know? and this went on and on, you know, after, so after about a month, uh, Britt corners him. He says, listen, Duke. Um, I need that. I need that raise. We have to talk about it. And Duke said, "Okay, well, um, come to my dressing room. You know, intermission. We'll talk." So he goes in the intermission, and um, so he said, "Well, Duke, you know, I've been here ten years. What do you what do you say?" And Duke says, "I'll give you a shirt." And so so Britt says, "I don't want a shirt. I want to." He says, "Yeah, but it's a blue shirt." So. Fritz says, no, that's not going to do it. You were, you're not taking this seriously. Uh, get back to me. Because uh, I, I have to have a razor. I'm going to have to leave. I'm, I really wouldn't like to leave, but I really would have to. After two weeks, he never heard from, from Duke, so he, he put in his notice. Uh, in jazz, there, there are some famous stories about people who give their notice. That that's, I think that's a pretty poignant story, because Ellington really he liked to avoid kind of conflict. But there's a funny story about uh, Count Basie was Duke Ellington's arch rival, although they were quite friendly, but that was the other really popular jazz big band of the swing era. And um, uh, Lester Young was the tenor saxophone star, tenor saxophone with Basie in the, in the Old Testament band from 1930, I guess he joined in 35 or 36 until 1941. And um, he went up to Basie one day and said, Bass, in four weeks, I will have been gone too. <laughs> I always love that one. Clark Terry uh, tells the story about Duke Ellington, um, how he joined Duke Ellington. This is one of my favorite stories. And, um, he was playing with Count Basie. And um, they're on the road, and Duke happens to be in the same town where they are at the same time. And um, he gets this. After the gig one night, uh, it's like four in the morning, and Clark is sleeping, and the phone rings. And um, he picks it up. Uh, and uh, the voice on the other end of the phone, uh, Clark Terry says, yeah. He says, uh, this is Duke. Well, Clark thought it was this guy, Duke, that he grew up with in East St. Louis. He said, Duke, the hell are you calling me for at this hour? Oh, man, call me at a decent hour. And he slams the phone down. So... About 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, Clark goes back to sleep, he gets all about 11 o'clock in the morning, the phone rings and uh, picks it up and he says, yes. And the uh, voice of the other, Clark Terry, is this a decent hour for you? He says, oh my God, it's Duke Ellington. And he recognizes the voice of the other. And uh, he says, yes. He says, well, I'd like to come up to your room and, uh, and speak to you about something, if I might. He says, well, uh, fine. Uh, when should we? He says, well, I'll be there in about a half hour, if that's okay. He said, oh, that'd be, that'd be just fine. So um, about a half hour, they buzz up uh, Clark from the desk, and uh, Clark goes to the door, and he opens the door, and at the same moment, 
Freddie Green, who's the guitar player in Basie's band, he's in the next room. He opens up his door to go out. To go out, he sees Clark, and then the elevator door opens, and there's Duke. And uh, Freddie looks at, at Clark. He looks at Duke, and he goes, "Oh shit!" He closes the door and goes back to into his room. And then Clark, you know, ushers Duke in, and, and Duke says, "Well, uh, you know, we would really love to have you play with with our band, but I would never take a brother." I would never take a, 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 a musician from my brother's band. But if you would happen to find yourself unemployed in three weeks while we're passing through St. Louis, we would have an opening for you. So Clark says, well, I really love playing with, with Basie, and I'll, I'll have to think about this. Uh, I'm very torn. So uh, Duke says, OK, well, take your time. Get back to me. Uh, and he leaves, and then uh, that night, Clark goes uh, to the gig, and as he's getting on the bandstand, he walks past Freddie Green, who is looking down, and he can't look at Clark in the eyes, and as he's walking past him, Freddie Green says, fool if you don't. <laughs> so, that night, uh, Clark uh, gave Basie his notice, he said uh, that he was feeling really tired, and uh, he just wanted to go home and rest for a while. And Basie said, okay. And, uh, and so then uh, Clark went home to St. Louis, and three weeks later he joined Duke's band and stayed for 10 years. He said that playing with Basie was like going to college, but playing with Duke Ellington was like going to grad school. <laughs> in the 1980s, Basie was old and, and quite sick, and he was in a wheelchair. And at Carnegie Hall, there was a, uh, a, a concert in, in tribute to Basie, and he was there. And, and all his friends were there, and the band was, the bassist band was playing, and all the great stars that had played with him that were still alive were there, and you know, people like Tony Bennett, people, you know, all kinds of great people were there. So Clark was invited to play, he was a big one of the stars with Basie, and he, he goes backstage, and um, he sees Basie, you know, this whole room full of people, and there's Basie in his wheelchair, and he says, oh man, I'm gonna have to, this may be my last chance. So he goes over to Basie, and he says, uh, Chief, there's something that I really, it's been, it's been really bothering me for many, many years. I have to, I have to tell you. And Basie says, well, uh, you mean about how you quit my band to join Duke? He says, you mean you knew? And he says, oh, sure. I would have done the same thing myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Duke, you know, the, the, the level of music, it's, Okay, here's, here's what I love about Duke Ellington. His music is about the blues and about swing, the feeling of swing. It's so exhilarating all the time. It's always about blues and swing. Every piece has that, those elements in it. And To give this this uh, this class on, uh, on Duke Ellington, it was like a graduate course at the Manhattan School of Music I did for many years, and it was a two semester course on Duke Ellington. And so, for two hours a week, for thirty weeks, we would talk about and analyze all his music. And in the first week, I would talk about what makes Duke Ellington great. You know, I had like twenty two points of why Duke Ellington was so great. And um, one of the things was that he was not. Uh, I love Bill Clinton. I think he was a great president. And he's a very nice man. Uh, but Bill Clinton's style of, of governing was checking the polls and, and, and trying to be popular. And I think that was a fault of his, trying to be popular. Duke was not trying to be popular. Somebody asked him um, in the 1960s, said, Duke, why do you have a clarinet in your band? All the other bands have given up clarinets. They're so out of style. And Duke said, no, New Orleans music has clarinet. It. That's a major part of that sound, which is, which is why I got into this music. It's what I love about this music. I like that sound, and there'll always be a clarinet in my band. It wasn't about style. He he never really changed his style. He started off in 19. His band formed his band, and well, actually formed it in Washington, um, in the in the 19 in the teens, in about 1918. And 
it was really like a like a wedding band, you know. They played for parties and they played popular music for parties. It wasn't a jazz band, really. And when they came to New York in 1923, it became a jazz band because um, Barbara Miley joined the band. And Barbara Miley was a, a great jazz trumpet player who was very much influenced by King Oliver. And so Duke became very much influenced by King Oliver. It was a great New Orleans, New Orleans jazz band. And a lot that just all that stuff that they did in the 1920s, that stayed in his music. You know, the music grew and, and drew in all these other elements. His music, Duke's music was just so inclusive. You know, it's like everything in the world, could, he would find a way to put it in that music. There was nothing that he would say, oh, we don't do that in our music. He would never say that. Like Charlie Parker would say, that, yeah, we don't do that, it's corny. But Duke, everything could have a, he could he found a way of making, making everything, there's a place if it's in the world, there's a place in his music that he would be able to to find to find how to make how to show that beautiful thing in his music. So he never really let go of the old of the old things in the music, and kept adding more things so that the music just kept growing and growing. Breath and depth. And I think he's got everybody beaten on those terms. And his music is truly original. You know, if you look at Aaron Copeland or people like that, they're writing. European music. It's not they were they were really not developing their own forms and they were basically dealing with the European forms and style of writing and, and just trying to Americanize that. But Duke came up with something a whole new system of harmony that all the other jazz people we've all kind of borrowed that and uh, and tried to figure out what he's doing. He's you know, he's been dead like was it nineteen seventy four he died, so that's is that twenty nine years? And it's 29 years, and we still haven't figured out a Could you tenth? talk a little bit about that harmony or how it was? Well, okay, in, in um, classical, European classical music, we basically deal with the diatonic scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, right? And the chromatic scale, do, d, re, re, you know, c, c sharp, d, d sharp, e, all the black, black and white notes on the piano. The, that's the chromatic scale. And so we're always in classical music, we're playing the diatonic scale against the, the chromatic scale. And so that's how we get the interest, you know. But Duke does that, and then he adds the blues scale to that, and he throws that in, it's like a wild card. Other people did that, and still do that, and they do it melodically, but they don't do it so much harmonically, in the harmonies. You know what the harmonies are? Like the chords. He, he puts that stuff on the inside of his chords, the inside people in the, in the, in the horns that are playing, well, not the top melody people all the time, but sometimes the top melody a lot of times is just a, a very simple diatonic song like uh, Three Blind Mice or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, any kind of folk song. That it, it, it's very, a lot of his melodic things are kind of simple, although they're, they're interesting, but they, they, they stay within the diatonic framework. And then and his, his, his harmonies will be chromatic, and they'll also have these blue notes in them. So, you, so it sounds like the blues, and it sounds real funky, and, and, but, it, and, and, but you don't hear that in the middle, and you say, well, how did he do that? And that's the real secret. Those blue notes are, are hidden inside there. Uh, I remember one time I was, uh, I was working with um, Jerry Mulligan's band. We just put this, uh, this concert jazz band back together, and some of the guys had died, and I got the great opportunity to play. And Bob Rickwire was in the band. Bob was a great arranger very influenced by Ellington and Gil Evans. And um, we played an arrangement of Bob's called Bwee Bada Bob Bada. And um, it's very, it's, it's a simple, I got, it's based on I Got Rhythm, a simple tune. And, and um, but when we played it, it had all this dissonance in it. And I said, wow, I had no idea this piece was so dissonant. I listened to the record, it sounds real normal. And, and he says, yeah, well, in, in the days when I used to do a lot of commercial music, you know, writing for TV commercials and for singers and stuff, they didn't want to hear about it about stuff that was jarring and all. So I learned how to sneak the dissonances into the middle of the chords so no one would notice. And, and, Duke, and Duke did that too. His, mu his music, his melodies are very singable, but they all have one thing in common, and which is what makes them really good melodies and really memorable, is that each one has a wide interval. Never treats me, you know, never treats, you know, that big jump. Every tune has got one of those. In my solitude, you haunt me. That big jump. It's either up or down, but it's always got one of those. And that's what makes those melodies so 
interesting and so musical and difficult to sing. Yeah, you know, pop music they don't do that anymore. You know, if you listen to any, any songs that are popular now, if you, you can find a melody. If there is a melody, they generally they have a lot of repeated notes. I'm not talking about rap. I'm talking about you know other forms. But you know they have repeated notes and they also walk up and down the scale. You know, do 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 they never they never go do 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 you know those big jumps, and that makes this music very expressive. And just you'll hear a lot of that today. We're going to do a piece called Heaven. Priscilla's going to sing Heaven and. Um, one of the really interesting things about this piece is that, and this is very typical of Ellington, this was like his first lesson that he gave his son Mercer, for his first lesson in writing music. This is the first lesson, this is the first lesson, this is what Mercer told me. He said, so uh, he called him Ellington, Mercer called his father Ellington, can you believe that? He says, so Ellington says to me, uh, okay, so what I want you to do, you, you play, take your, finger in your left hand, and you play one note on the piano, and you hold it out, and then you play your, in your right hand, you play a series of notes. You can play a, play a melody in your right hand. And you can't repeat the note that's in your left hand. You can't play that note in your right hand. The left hand and the right hand always have to be doing something different. When you run out of stuff to say, then you can change the note in your left hand and play some more stuff. That was lesson number one. <laughs> lesson number two. Play two notes in your left hand, hold them down, and do the same thing. You can't use either of those notes in your right hand. And lesson number three was play three notes in your left hand. So, in Ellington's music, and also in Strayhorn's music, we find that the melody, those notes, aren't going to be expressed in the harmony parts. So that that melody jumps out at you and has real individuality. When I joined the Ellington band, my first, this is my first experience, right? My first job, I, I don't think I did a rehearsal. Well, maybe I, yeah, I did one rehearsal. But we only rehearsed like a couple of the new things. We didn't do any of the, any of the old ones. So we get to the gig and I'm sitting next to Cootie Williams, who's Ellington's great trumpet star. Been in the band on and off for 50 years. So, Cootie's sitting next to me and the first piece up is, is C Jam Blues. And Cootie says to me, I'm going to teach you your part. Listen to me play it tonight. I'm only going to play it once. This is it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, pay attention. Don't screw up. And I said, I'm listening really hard. All right? So I, I got it. So the, the next, you know, and I'm not just talking about da 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 I'm talking about the whole shout chorus at the end. you got to remember, all I got it. So the next night, First number up is CJ and Blues. And we start to play. And it gets to that spot, right? And I start to play what Cootie played the night before. I play like two notes. And Art Barron, my buddy in the trombone section, he turns around and he says, Get off my note! <laughs> See, in Duke's band, everybody's got their own note. You know, let's get it off my note. that spooked me. I didn't know what to do then. I, said, I must have screwed it up. I must have not remembered what Cootie taught me. And I didn't know what to do after that. Well, that was like 1974, about, uh, well, about three or four years ago. I was on the road with a piece called the Harlem Nutcracker. We took Duke and Strayhorn's Nutcracker and we made a full-length dance piece out of it. I wrote the rest, wrote the rest of the Tchaikovsky uh, melodies in the same style. We did, we did one out with this dance company. We would go, like every Christmas season, we'd go out for six or eight weeks. And the contractor, the trombone player and contractor on the gig was Art Barron. So we're having dinner one night. and. Uh, and uh, I said, yeah, I remember, you know, like when I joined Duke's band, and I, you know, and he just he turned around and said, get off my note. He says, oh, we used to do that to everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they were tough. I mean, there were stories about the, the guys would get off the, off the, uh, the band bus and they'd be on the road for like months at a time. They worked like, you know, 360 days a year. It was amazing. They traveled all the time. Well, they would get off the bus and uh, and uh, go you know, to a, a greasy spoon to, to get something to eat on the side of the road, and uh, and 16 guys would get off the bus and sit at 16 different tables. That was, yeah. that was the story. But I, it wasn't quite like that. I, in fact, I asked Clark Terry. Clark Terry is such a a great man. I mean, I, not only is he one of the great trump, trumpet players of all time, but he's just a great human being. I, being with Clark Terry is like. You're on a high, you know, just from 
the spiritual level that, that he's on. I mean, and he got a lot of this from Duke. And I, you know, we would walk down the street sometimes. I've, I've worked quite a bit with Clark. And, you know, we would walk down the street and, and he, everybody would be saying hello to him. You know, not just you know, business people and people in the arts, or shoeshine boys and, and the newspaper guy and everybody. And man, Clark, you know everybody. I said, is there is there anybody that you that you don't like? Is there anybody that you hate? I said, no. Well, except for Ken Anderson, of course. <laughs> so, Ken Anderson was Duke's star first trumpet player for many years, <laughs> from the mid '40s and up to the late '60s. So we're talking like 25 years. He, he played first trumpet with Duke and played a lot of high note stuff. And Duke was, you know, it was kind of freaky that he could play so high and so loud. It was like it's amazing, you know. And Duke thought that was great. It was sort of like a circus, you know, uh, like the high wire act. And, uh, and, uh, but the guys in the band all hated Cat because one was that Cat would go into their, their suitcases, he'd steal stuff from them, and he, would, he, was just, he was evil, you know, he just was nasty all the time to everybody. And, um, so uh, I always wondered, why would Duke keep Cat in the band? And this is his reasoning. Duke figured out early on that in every band, everyone hates the leader. You know, it's like everyone hates the boss, right? So everyone hates the leader, and they always, they always talk. So he figured, I'm going to have somebody in the band that everybody hates so much they'll forget about me. They'll like me. That's what he said. We have about five more minutes. Any questions, or do you want David to just keep telling Slavery? wonderful yeah. stories? Uh, it said that Duke wrote specific uh, songs for players. And um, it was actually for the table concert, and you thought, you know, like, come Sunday, would it be rain amps? And you really wrote for, you know, the violin? Yeah, uh, that's such a perfect question. It's amazing. Okay. The, the, one of the, the thing that separates Duke Ellington's music from every other great composer is the personal nature of every part. You know, Bach wrote for different soloists. Beethoven, they wrote for different, they wrote pieces for different soloists, you know. Uh, pianists or whoever the concerto was for, but they didn't write for the guy who played second violin. It didn't matter. There's a whole bunch of second violin players. It doesn't really matter who it is. It's an anomalous, an anonymous part. And but for Ellington, everybody's part had their name on it. It wasn't just trumpet one, trumpet two, trumpet three. It was Cat Anderson, and Clark Terry, and Ray Nance, and Shorty Baker. Those were the trumpets, and each it, ma it mattered which one played which part? Not only for the solos, but for even for the inside parts. A famous story about Billy Strayhorn wrote this arrangement. And he brings it in and he rehearses it. And it sounds wonderful, of course, like all of Billy's arrangements. And Duke says, Billy, would you mind if I, if I just change one little thing? And Billy would say, well, not, a, not at all, Duke. Please. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Duke would say, well, Butter, uh, Butter played second trombone, and Britt, who played first trombone, he said, you know that note that you have in the second bar of letter G? You know, we have a chord in the second bar of letter G? I, you know, I want you two guys to switch your notes so that Butter, you have Britt's note, and Britt, you now play Butter's note. And all the other, you know, 13 horns, they'll all play at the same time. Okay, so it's okay, now let's try this. And they get to that spot and they play that chord. It was like a completely different chord, even though it was all the same notes, but just those two guys switched which notes they were playing. Each other. This is like perfect pitch on a higher level. You know? Okay, the music that was written for this sacred concert was written for Duke's band. So, yes, all the uh, all the parts uh, were written with those specific players in mind. Now, the arrangement that that we do on Come Sunday is very interesting. He performed some. He had several arrangements of Come Sunday that he did for different singers in different keys. This one. Is the arrangement that we're using, I needed to do it in this specific key that we have it in. And the only arrangement I knew that he did in this key was, a, actually it's a Billy Strayhorn arrangement, that was written for Ray Nance to play on the violin. And so instead of having Ray play the violin, well, we can't have Ray because he's no longer with us, but having, instead of having someone play the violin, uh, Priscilla's going to sing the melody where Ray would have been playing it on the violin, but we're going to use all the backgrounds that were written for Ray. So this brings up a very interesting issue. Many Ellington aficionados say, well, now that Ellington is gone, there's no point in playing Duke's music. We should just listen to the old records because he wrote it for those specific people 
they're not here anymore, and no band could ever get that sound again. Well, it's true, no band will ever get that sound again. But that doesn't mean that the music can't be great played by other people. For instance, Shakespeare's music was written for his stock company. His, each one of those roles was written for specific people, and yet we performed them We've performed them for 400, what, 450 years uh, with all kinds of different people, and it's great. Uh, Duke said, I asked Duke one time about it, and I said, I, I transcribe all your music, I write it all down so that we can all play it, and do we need to play it? I mean, should I be writing down everything so that we play it exactly like you do, or should I be doing it so that it's different? He said, you know, I told, you know the sacred music, you know, I want to... I've got some other ideas, you know, in order to make it a good show, should I make the show? He says, it doesn't have to be the same to be good. It only has to be good. His basic rule of music was, if it sounds good, it is good. No rules, just if it sounds good, it is good. So, we're going to try to sound good tonight, and we're going to... I don't think we're going to do it the same as Duke Ellington, and we're not going to really try to do it the same, although we're going to try to um, get into the spirit of his music. He said that the purpose of his music was to inspire the performers to be great. He said, you don't have to play any of the notes that I wrote as long as you're great. Of course, the notes help to inspire us to that greatness. So that's what we're going to attempt today, and I hope that you all enjoy it. And, um, We've been having a great time. This is a remarkable group of musicians that have come together to do this. It's very difficult music, and uh, no one has ever played, uh, no one in the band has ever played any of this stuff before. And we've, the first time I saw them was on Friday. They, were, they had a few rehearsals beforehand just to get together. And on Friday, when I, we started rehearsing, it sounded like 15 guys that never met each other. And then on Saturday, it was starting to sound like a band. And uh, today, it sounds like a good band. Oh. So, I think you're going to enjoy it. The choir has done a wonderful job in getting their music together. And of course, our soloists are really outstanding. And um, I think there'll be a lot of moving moments. And I, I look forward to it. Thanks for coming. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to get something to eat before the show. So. I'll see you in a little while. Thanks. David, were you in uh, Saratoga with the Mulligan Man? No, 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 no,